Hello, I'm John Y.K. Lee, Professor of Neurosurgery at the University of Pennsylvania. The information I'm providing today is not supported by the university, it is for entertainment purposes only. I'm sitting here in the historic library at Pennsylvania Hospital, this beautiful, gorgeous historic library where the textbooks here are several hundreds of years old. Having been here now over 18 years, having taken patients, seeing them in the office, doing the surgery, seeing them after, and then seeing them years and decades later, who are some of the patients that may do well after trigeminal neuralgia microvascular decompression surgery? In this video, what I hope to do is review the features and the predictors that I believe are important for success for surgery for microvascular decompression. I've done over a thousand of these operations. I've been here almost 20 years. I've done over a thousand just of the surgeries, but if you count the gamma knife procedures and the radiofrequency and the glycerol rhizotomies and the peripheral nerve stimulators I've placed, I have some degree of experience. And what I wanna review for you today is literally, who do I think is going to improve after the microvascular decompression surgery? Now, a lot of what I'm gonna say here is based on anecdote. It's not necessarily based on science, although it is grounded in retrospective studies and papers, but it's impossible for us to run a randomized control trial here. I can't just take patients and just say flip a coin and say, okay, you get surgery, you don't. But what I can say is that having been here now over 18 years, having taken patients, seeing them in the office, doing the surgery, seeing them after, and then seeing them years and decades later, so some of them come back with more facial pain, I have a general idea and gestalt of who I think will do well. So, number one, trigeminal neuralgia is a diagnosis that is made by the clinician. The doctor has to talk to you, and I need to get a sense of how you experience the pain. Sharp lightning bolt pain that comes on suddenly and lasts just for a few seconds, less than, definitely less than a minute or two. That sudden onset of pain into the face that is more typical trigeminal neuralgia. I have other patients, I see so many patients in the office and they might describe, oh, I was having pain in my tooth and they removed the tooth and now it's uh, burning pain. And um, that is not trigeminal neuralgia. I have other patients that have a mix and it gets very difficult. And I, I do appreciate Kim Birchall's approach. He tried to divide trigeminal neuralgia into both a TN type 1 and a trigeminal neuralgia type 2, where it's greater than 50% or less than 50% of the sharp shooting lightning bolt pain. I really want to know whether the patient has that sharp shooting lightning bolt pain. You know, I had a eureka moment. I was reading Fred Barker's paper. Fred Barker is wonderful. His father was chairman of general surgery here at Penn, and um, his son is a neurosurgeon at Mass General Hospital, and he was unique because at his time he went to Pittsburgh worked with Dr. Peter Janetta, called his patients up, and published the New England Journal paper on trigeminal neuralgia outcomes. Now, the eureka moment was when I read through his paper and I read through the methods, and he specifically said, the presence of constant burning, atypical features, this type of pain does not represent a failure of the microvascular decompression. So even in his outcome study, what he did was he focused on sharp shooting lightning bolt pain because that is the pain that we know will improve after microvascular decompression. So the number one predictor and what I spend a lot of time in my office is trying to figure out whether you have ex you experience sharp shooting lightning bolt pain. Now another issue is what if your pain started like that and then you took seizure drugs and then the uh, seizure drugs converted your pain, now that kind of pain is better, but now you have more constant uh, pain. Well, I still feel that the surgery can help because it can help get you off those seizure drugs. And that brings me to another point. Why seizure drugs? Well, you get that sharp shooting pain, it's almost like having a seizure because we believe it's something intrinsic to the nerve. The nerve has an axon potential and has a difference between the sodium channel, the sodium ions on one side and the other side creating a uh, electrical gradient. And then these drugs help stabilize that gradient or raise the threshold from which it needs to fire. So by giving you a seizure drug, it helps reduce your pain because the pain seems to be coming from the nerve itself. The 
response to carbamazepine, which is the classic drug for this, is a very important predictor. If you get good pain relief with carbamazepine, well, I am much more confident that you are going to get benefit from surgery. So that's another predictor I use in the operating room. Well, not every patient takes carbamazepine because it's an old drug, it has a lot of side effects. Well, there's also its analog, trileptal or oxcarbazepine. So I think the response to that is also helpful. Now, what about gabapentin or Neurontin or some of its analogs, Lyrica? My sense of that drug is it's not a very potent seizure drug. I don't actually get a sense that it's a very potent uh, anti-epileptic at all. In fact, it's not indicated for seizures. And similarly, I don't feel that it is a great predictor of success uh, for trigeminal neuralgia. So these are some of the features um, that I think about. And when I see a patient and I, I, I'm trying to figure out who's going to do better with microvascular decompression, how about some other things? Numbness. Not a lot of people describe numbness of the face. But if you have numbness of the face, and now what I mean by that is, let's say you go to the dentist and you, you get that um, injection or they have numbed up your, so they can do a dental procedure, and then you can't feel, you touch it and you can't feel it. Numbness is not trigeminal neuralgia. Numbness is sinister. For me, when I see numbness, number one, sometimes dentists cause injury to the nerve and that's trigeminal neuropathic pain, and that pain um, when you have numbness and pain, that is a, 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 not a great condition, obviously, because um, that it could be a predecessor to anesthesia dolorosa, where you have numbness and pain. So that is not good. The other thing is numbness means the nerve is damaged in some way, whether it be from a dental procedure or a surgical procedure, or whether you were numbed by a tumor. Now, I've been around the block quite a bit. I've been here 18 years, over 18 years. When someone has numbness, I immediately start looking for cancer. There, I have several patients, they've had lymphoma, they've had other cancers, they've had skin cancer that's spread. If you've had a history of skin cancer, and then you have numbness and pain, that is almost certainly not trigeminal neuralgia. Um, that is perineural spread, the tumor has spread along the nerve. So these are some features that I look for. How am I gonna predict who's gonna do well after my surgery, because what I want are happy patients. I want my patient after surgery to feel great, uh, that they are happy that they chose me for surgery. Other predictors. This is a big one. Vascular compression on MRI. How important is vascular compression on MRI? Now, I don't like when people uh, try to diagnose trigeminal neuralgia just on imaging. Trigeminal neuralgia is not an imaging diagnosis. It's a diagnosis made by a clinician in interviewing the patient. It requires old-fashioned clinical skills. Talk to the doctor. It cannot be made by imaging. The people who try to make a diagnosis by looking at your MRI, they, it's wrong. The MRI and the search for vascular compression is helpful in is predict for surgery, but there are patients with vascular compression that have no facial pain. I do other tumors, I do other, the people get MRIs and I see vascular compression all the time, but that doesn't mean they have trigeminal neuralgia. They have no experience of pain. So how can imaging be the way to diagnose trigeminal neuralgia? It's absolutely incorrect. Another thing, the imaging is helpful before surgery because if I see a vessel on imaging, I will see it in the operating room, absolutely. But the negative predictive value of MRI is very poor. Kim Burchell did a great paper on this and he demonstrated that the, if you take patients with a negative MRI, you take them to the operating room, they still have vascular compression. And that's because with the microscopes, with the endoscopes I use, I can see so much more than what I can be seen on MRI. MRI gives us some clue but my God, I can see arachnoid, I can see, I mean, with the endoscope, I can see almost individual red blood cells going through the vessels. So the idea that you can diagnose trigeminal neuralgia with imaging to me is just completely wrong. What I'm trying to do in my office is predict who's gonna do well. If I see vascular compression, I know I will see it in the operating room. If I don't see vascular compression, but you have sharp shooting lightning bolt, classic features, then 
I will still take you to the operating room and more often than not, I still find vascular compression because again, I can see more than what can be seen with the MRI alone. So despite lots of experience, despite having studied this procedure and actually written pa multiple papers and actually getting a master's degree in the study of outcomes of trigeminal neuralgia, I don't know everything. And I, my heart still feels for some patients who come in and they're just looking for answers and I can't provide them. I wish I could provide everybody with some answer for their pain, but the study of pain remains elusive. Animal models are kind of not there and um, I hope that one day we can find answers for you. Fortunately, I feel that in the field of orofacial pain, I am only really good at treating trigeminal neuralgia, which is a small subset. And I've defined for you in this episode some of the features of patients that I think can benefit from trigeminal neuralgia surgery, specifically microvascular decompression. I hope this is useful to you, and um, I provide this information to you so that when you come meet me or any other neurosurgeon, you have a general sense of where we can help you. All right, very good. Thank you for watching this video. If you're interested in more videos that I've created about trigeminal neuralgia, here's a link to Father Corrigan describing his story. Here's another link to a video I created over a decade ago, and it's actually one of the most watched videos among the Penn website with over 100,000 views. Please feel free to link and subscribe.